everybody. Thank you for coming. I know this is a busy time of year. People have all kinds of field work and other things on the go, so we appreciate you uh, coming out to the presentation by uh, our good friend and colleague, Dr. Felix DeCora. Um, Felix is uh, from Schwane uh, University of Technology in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, he did his uh, PhD at the University of Western Australia. Um, his supervisor of his PhD and the supervisor of my PhD worked under the same supervisor of the University of Western Australia. So that makes Felix and myself academic cousins. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, uh, I think that's, that's the language we're using. Uh, after his uh, PhD at UWA, uh, he worked for a year at the Smithsonian Institute looking at CO2 fluxes from uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay. Um, he then did a postdoc uh, fellowship with Dr. Don Biltz at the uh, University of California, Davis. Don Biltz is a very, very famous person in plant microbe interaction, discovered some of the original signals going out <coughs> from the plant to tell the bacteria, I'm here, I'd like to set up, set up a relationship with you, and Felix was involved with that research. After his stint at UC Davis, he returned to Africa, uh, initially as an appointment at the University of Cape Town, and I visited Felix uh, there a number of years ago, and then uh, currently to his uh, current position at uh, Pretoria. So Felix's uh, title is there. I'm not going to uh, repeat it. Uh, you saw it on the flyers as well. But uh, it, it's a very broad view of look at legumes and all kinds of things that can do and how important it can be in terms of sustainability uh, in places like South Africa and elsewhere. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Dakara. Thank you, Kevin. I guess you can hear me. Oh, that was good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I was telling Kevin when I was doing geography at the ordinary level in Ghana, which is my country of birth, I always, you know, the way they taught us was to give us all the provinces of uh, Canada and then the states of America. And so they just have geographic. Uh, uh, boundaries, and uh, you have a dot, and they ask you to fill in the states, <laughs> and if it's Canada, fill in the province, and the dot is the capital of that state. Please fill in the capital. And I was telling him, I always thought Nova Scotia was an island. That's all what I recollected <laughs> several years ago when many of you, the youngsters, were not born. Uh, he told me it's sort of an island because it's just a small piece of land. Otherwise, it would have been. So I'm um, pleasantly happy to be here today. I never knew I'd ever get to Nova Scotia, and here I am. So uh, I thank you for that, Kevin. And we've come a long way, as is indicated. And uh, you know, we have this mutual interest in what we learned at the graduate school level. Uh, he's told me all the things he's now doing. He's branched off into other things. Uh, I'm still stuck in uh, you know, the whole things that we were doing, because African situation is very different. At the end of the talk, you will appreciate uh, some of uh, the complexities of what we have in Africa. Uh, when Kevin, uh, and thank you, Kevin, for sponsoring me to come and give the talk, I told him he could guide me what I should talk about, because sometimes you can just go off tangent and say things that your audience is not interested in. So he said, pitch it at a very broad level that was you know, linked to sustainability, and the environment and in Africa you can't walk away from food security. So hence the title that I have. So basically what we do uh, in my lab and uh, in Africa in general, for most of us, uh, we're into the area of legumes. Legume research for a range of reasons. So but I'll just click through and show you something species that we work on, this is serving, showing inoculated plants at the far end where the young lady is, that's uh, Tiobolina Thomas, and here is point inoculated. And uh, this is cowpea, it's uh, the leading uh, food growing legume in Africa, and Africa actually produces by far uh, most of the cowpea in the world. 
and uh, it's a very important crop. You can see it in cultivated in different forms. It's a monoculture, that's a, a mixed culture. And these ladies and gentlemen are farmers who came to evaluate some of the uh, selections of the breeding program. And so it was what they call it, farmers who day. And uh, this is one of uh, my former students. She did a master's. This was her uh, grammar trial. Uh, so she was just somewhere there trying to look at you know, different genotypes. I think about 25 that were being evaluated for plant growth and water use efficiency, nitrogen fixation. Uh, this is one of the indigenous African legumes. It's called Bambara granut or Vignus terrenian. It's geocapic like granite. It forms the pus in the in the soil. So you have to dig it up and show it up so that people can appreciate uh, the kind of yields you can get from some of these uh, species. Now, obviously, these are often crops in the context that they are underutilized, they are under researched. But as you can see, you know. Uh, there's potential for some of these crop species if um, uh, resources were invested in them. There's another one, it's more or less like a cousin to the one you just saw. Uh, it's called Kestin Bean, it used to be called Kestin Jella Geocapa, uh, but it's now called uh, uh, Macrochiloma Geocapa. It's also, I mean, it's also geocapic, it forms a seed in the ground. And Basically, if you have this one and the previous one next to each other, and you're not a very good student, you will actually know the difference between casting bean and uh, uh, bambara granite. This is pigeon pea. It's a very important crop in Africa and Asia, all the way to India. Uh, very high yielding in general, drought tolerant, and also it's very good for producing biomass. So you can see it's intercrop of maize, and here the idea was to, you know, Put in your cereal, add legume, the cereal might grow quickly. This one can go all the way into late summer. And so now you, you know, this the maize has been harvested or near harvested, uh, near harvesting. And you get a lot of droppings of leaves, which becomes a good source of organic matter and uh, mineral nitrogen. This man bean, um, uh, Vecna radiata, again, we work on that one too. What I haven't told you is that. We're working on so many different types of legumes for a range of reasons. One is that South Africa is uh, probably not as, you know, um, a melting pot in terms of human origins and, you know, the diversity of people. But we have our fair share of Asians in, uh, in South Africa. In fact, um, outside India, the next, the next country with the largest concentration of Indians is South Africa for historical reasons, just as you have. African Americans in the US, so did we get Indians in Devon. It was a major sugarcane plantation area, and so people were brought there to work on the sugarcane plantations. So we have anything up between four and five uh, million Indians uh, within Devon, and never mind the other uh, uh, components of the Indian population. So now, why do we study all these legumes? Uh, to contextualize it, it's just because we have too many problems in the country. We have food insecurity or food problems. We have got, and as a consequence of that, we have protein color malnutrition. That often occurs when you have very low food intake of malaria strong. And the continent is also, as you probably know, is the oldest continent on the planet. And so the soils are highly infertile. The older your continent gets, the less fertile the soils. Uh, somebody ever told me when I was giving a talk like this, they well, you know, give it to you asking too much. You know, the soils are better because the continent is old, but you've got all the minerals, you've got all the oil, you've got all the gases. What more can you ask for? And I said, yeah, I wish we could still have, you know, those soils in the continent rather than what we currently have. And uh, in addition to protein, color, and nutrition, we also have all sorts of other physiological disorders. That includes uh, trace element deficiency, which is to be expected. Once your soils are nutrient poor, it means food crops that are grown on those soils are bound to be deficient in mineral-based minerals. There's diabetes, which is again also related to uh, you know, living style and nutrition. Uh, we have fascia core in children. It's a word that many of you wouldn't know. This disease was discovered in West Africa. It's just wasting away of a child when there's inadequate uh, nutrition, when there's famine, there's limited food intake. 
child cannot develop the and tend to you know develop a, a, a big pot belly and shrinking limbs and hands and what have you. It's not the best condition to see any child in. So all of these actually become a challenge to us as uh, biological scientists and those working more specifically within um, agriculture. And I was just talking about the uh, infertility status of the African soils. And this is from um, uh, Neil Peter. Nature is a, the key to tackling hunger in Africa is enriching the soil. The big debate is about how to do it. You know, somebody's going to say fertilize, dominate a lot of fertilizers and harvest good yield. Others say, well, you're going to damage the environment. How about if you look at the alternative ways of overcoming the problem? So that's currently a debate. Nobody knows which way to go. We all think we know, but others will tell you don't know. So essentially, this shows you that the African soil, although it looks dark, actually, uh, to a first year student in agriculture, you wouldn't say this is dead poor. It quite looks like a nice dark soil, but essentially there are no nutrients. Okay, I think this is the one that I'm taking in Europe just to show you that. So what are the options to Africa? Well, otherwise, you have the question of poor values. Where is Africa going? And some of us believe that uh, in that debate as to what approach to use, there are good biological options. And one of them is biological natural fixation. And uh, we think, of personally, I'm convinced that it is a key to Africa's food security and nutritional problems uh, for the simple reason that we're dealing with a large number of resource poor farmers who cannot afford fertilizers and other chemical inputs. So this tends to be the cheapest way that you can actually tap atmospheric nitrogen for agricultural development. And that process of biological nitrogen fixation has um, uh, Kevin gave me from the introduction, I did some earlier work done this around this. Essentially it starts by an interaction between the legume and that side which is an alfalfa seedling with the rhizobium bacterium which is here. And as it happens in course even between men and women, you know, somebody has to have the, you have to have the chemistry to do that way. Now, so these guys deal in really chemical molecules. So the postman will release some molecules, flavonoids, and if this is the right pattern, it will understand the language and respond. And so, uh, essentially, this is the right pattern, these flavonoids or betaine will bind into the you know, D protein of the bacterium, and in so doing, uh, it induces expression of regulation genes, and once the genes are expressed, they then also uh, synthesize other bacterial molecules here called regulation factors, and this is lipocarbosaccharide. And that then uh, is also perceived by the host plant, which then causes certain things to happen, uh, like you know, uh, forming uh, the bacterium attaching to an infection thread, and in the process of that, the nodule gets developed. So this is the outcome of that uh, process I just showed you. This is cowpea. And uh, these are big fat nodules that have just been that up uh, from the soil. And it is in these uh, nodules that nitrogen, that nitrogen is uh, fixed or reduced from uh, N2 to ammonia. And when the ammonium is formed, the bacteria cell uses what it can to meet its nitrogen requirements. And the excess ammonia that's left, because ammonia is toxic, it gets formed out of the bacteria cell into the host plant cell, where then the host plant uses that to make a lot of nitrogenous sodas, including the amino acids. And so this where, and of course, in return, the bacterium in doing this requires a lot of ATP, and that normally that will come from the carbohydrate that the plant has um, you know, transferred to the bacterium. So that's where the symbiosis comes in, this kind of give and take. And uh, it is uh, the basis of this uh, ammonium that constitutes a lot of what I'm going to talk about. So essentially, I see biological nitrogen fixation as the unifying solution to Africa's problem when it comes to food security and uh, some of the environmental issues. In that nitrogen fixation does contribute to the nitrogen economy when the plant, uh, you have the grain, the residue that's left is a biofertilizer. You can plow it in and it will release nitrogen for subsequent crops. But nitrogen fixation can also increase soil fertility other than nitrogen. I will get to that later. And, uh, Nitrogen fixation does contribute in many ways to plant and animal protein, other direct loading directly. Directly, when the plant takes advantage of the ammonium that has been released by the bacterium to increase its protein level, 
and it becomes a good source of uh, uh, plant protein for eggs and worms. And of course, if you have pasture and forage legumes and animal feed on that, that's also you know high protein feed for the animals that uh, makes them uh, produce uh, good amount of protein for human consumption. And the nitrogen fixation also increases uh, can increase legume and cereal yields uh, either within an intercrop situation or when you do a, a crop rotation. And the last but not the least is that the nitrogen fixation can be used to overcome trace element efficiency uh, within uh, 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 rural communities. Now, if we take the uh, role of nitrogen fixation contributing to uh, soil nitrogen economy, uh, here we have a slide that shows measurements of nitrogen fixation in 25,000 you know, types of varieties that were grown in three locations in Africa. Uh, the first one is Wa, which is in the Hini savanna of Ghana. Manga is in the Sahelian savanna of Ghana, and Tau is a, it's a savanna environment in South Africa. So these are three very different agroecological zones, and we measure nitrogen fixation in all those three. What is important to note that this is the amount of the plant nitrogen that is obtained from the atmosphere. And so, if you look there on this row, you see that essentially the least is that one. So uh, it is 58% uh, nitrogen was obtained by that genotype from the atmosphere. So, in Noa, you can say that all the types of varieties are obtained an awful amount of nitrogen from the nitrogen fixation. You come from Manga, that's less so. Some of them, many of them, I would say, are low 50% uh, in terms of meeting the nitrogen, nitrogen requirements. And if you come to Karun, South Africa, again, you get a very high figure. So, I mean, figure. So, this actually indicating that uh, these uh, genotypes or varieties are fairly high in nitrogen fixation, especially at Wa and, uh, and Tau. And uh, if we look at the actual amount of nitrogen fix, which is measured in, in kilograms nitrogen per hectare, you can see that it's quite substantial. Those are the indications of which uh, localities we're looking at. The first one is Tau, the second one is Manga, and the third one, uh, Mona Xavira is one. And clearly you can see that uh, many of them uh, were very effective in uh, fixing nitrogen. We just put this artificial line as a cutoff point for 100 kilograms nitrogen or more that were fixed. And yeah, there's quite a number of them that have gone beyond the 100 kilograms nitrogen uh, you know, uh, mark. Uh, clearly showing that these legumes have huge potential to contribute to the nitrogen fertility of cropping systems and for that matter to contribute to the nitrogen economy of, of soils. This slide just gives a measure of what has been done in other African countries. Again, this is on Kalki. And you can see strong variation uh, between uh, or amongst the genotypes that were measured. Some there to have Zimbabwe as low as 4 to 29. So it depends on the legal genotype you use and the effectiveness of the symbiosis. You may get huge amounts of NFIX or very low amounts of NFIX. Of course, but these values are also influenced by the methodology that we use. But anyway, whatever it is, it's just a summary slide to show what the situation is um, in other parts of the continent. This other one is another continental uh, table is showing soya bean, uh, and again, you can see this work was done on stations, research stations, and you can see the range of nitrogen that uh, was fixed or has been fixed, and these represent the techniques used and the references. Now, in general, most people in the era of biological nitrogen fixation tend to think that. Uh, for whatever reason, nitrogen fixation of farmer fields might be very low due to the way that, especially in traditional agriculture, the way that uh, they do their planting, the way they manage the cropping systems and whatnot. So we did have one study uh, uh, somewhere in, in Ghana in a number of villages, those are the villages listed there. That's a planting that's, that's one thing that you would appreciate. But one farmers are using very low plant density, they cannot actually uh, maximize on this biological nitrogen fixation for soil fertility. Because the, you may get one plant here, one plant over there, and one plant there. At the end of the day, that has 
zero and one, very little but not zero, but very minuscule impact for large scale contribution. But for its work, we just wanted to show that indeed on these farmer scale, uh, <coughs> cow pea species will obtain an awful lot of nitrogen from the atmosphere. However, the amount fixed just in the sheet generally look very low because of uh, the planting density. If the planting density has actually been going to play. Otherwise, biologically, there's nothing uh, in the biological process of nitrogen fixation is in no way um, you know, altered or reduced on farmer scales as uh, indicated by what's called the, the percentage of nitrogen derived from fixation. And so now, with what I've just shown you, there is ample evidence that we can tap into this biological nitrogen for increasing crop yields. And this slide gives uh, a sense of that. This is maize grown after maize, and this is maize grown after bean. You can see, you know, just uh, uh, visually, that this is by far a better crop compared to that one. And that if you're a resource poor farmer, you're better off going uh, on this kind of route, this kind of technology, where you plant legumes after, I mean, plant uh, cereal by maize after legume, as here, rather than continue to plant cereal after cereal after cereal, because then you further deplete your soils, and that leads to much more lower yields. But we did some studies long time ago uh, in Ghana where we actually could quantify the benefits of nitrogen fix. And here we have granular, 101 kilogram nitrogen when fixed and following uh, harvest of the grain and all of that. Uh, the legume residue has 68 kilograms nitrogen. And uh, following um, the planting of the cereal crop that was maize, we could quantify 41 kilograms N as the benefit directly that went into um, uh, increasing the yields of the following crop. And we found exactly the same thing with, uh, with cow pea. And, and so these benefits are quantifiable. And if you really want to then um, estimate uh, the fertilizer equivalence of biological nitrogen, that um, uh, has been captured, you just do a simple experiment like this. Suffice it to say, you look at your legume, in this case, granite, and you come and look at maize, uh, after maize with this nitrogen treatment. And the value, any of these values as closest to this gives you a uh, fertilizer equivalent. So if you look at this row here, that one, 1871 is nearer to 1790. So for that particular system, you say that uh, there was uh, the benefit of nitrogen was 60 kilograms uh, um, nitrogen per hectare. In other words, that's the nitrogen equivalent of the benefit of nitrogen fixed by the way. Similarly, if you look at cow pea, that one there, and you come and look at what value here is nearer to 1857. So in the two systems, uh, the conclusion we arrived at was that you can get a benefit of least uh, 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare being contributed by your legume crop to uh, your following cereal. I'm just going to skip that, uh, those who are the biomass. And uh, we now can take on um, the other aspect, the fact that nitrogen fixation also does increase nutrient fertility other than nitrogen itself. I've just shown about the nitrogen. And if we take this slide, it's a bit of a busy slide, but just Permit me to take you through very gently. Essentially, this was something we bumped into. We did estimates of nitrogen fixation, as I showed you, using 30 genotypes, n equals 30. And when we analyzed uh, nutrients in the leaves, we realized that there was a relationship between yeast minerals in the leaves and nitrogen fixation. If you look here, this is the plant biomass, and this amount of n fixed. And you can see that. The ones that are fixing a lot of nitrogen tend to grow much better, more robust, with a lot of biomass. The ones that fix less nitrogen tend to have a very low plant biomass. And so that's the first point. And what I haven't included here is grain yield. It also goes exactly the same way. High levels of nitrogen fixation gives you higher levels of biomass, which equals higher levels of grain. And low levels of nitrogen fix, low biomass, low grain. So there's that direct relationship between N, amount of N fix and um, uh, and grain yield. And then when we did this analysis on leaves, lo and behold, we found 
another list, uh, we could categorize this work into high fixes, intermediate, and low fixes. But for brevity of presentation, I just chose three high fixes and one low fixer. And if you look at natrium fix versus these mineral nutrients, you can see the so called high fixes all tend to have higher concentrations of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, and sodium compared to low fixer, which is down. So those are the concentrations, and if you calculate that on amount they leave, again, they're exactly the same trend. Uh, greater amounts of uh, minerals in the high fixing phenotype of varieties compared to low fixing, um, uh, low fixing genotype. And if you look at the trace elements or micronutrients, it's exactly the same pattern, you can see. And at the end of the day, what I want to say is, when you, in the olden days, so historically, people looked at um, crop rotations as being, uh, I think they were just essentially two benefits. One is nitrogen that is uh, from symbiosis, you know, that gets released in the soil where organic matter decomposes and then, of course, uh, breaking the disease pattern in soils. Now, we didn't actually know this. So essentially, it's clear that when you plow in the residue of these legumes following grain yield, you are returning supplementary minerals to uh, your rotational system for your following cereal crop, which otherwise would not be able to, um, uh, to accumulate these. So that's the basis for saying that nitrogen fixation actually does increase uh, nutrient fertility other than symbiotic nitrogen uh, supply. And uh, to follow up on that, this is, um, I showed you uh, Bambara Grana, so that's a Bambara Grana farm, uh, uh, which the lady was, uh, the one in charge was harvesting when we brought there. And, uh, you know, she knows the importance of biofertilizer. Incidentally, she's got a very small patch of field. The fields are not very big in many of these communities. So you need intensive cultivation. And to do it, intensive cultivation means returning legume residue if you don't have enough money to buy chemical fertilizer. So she, after harvesting the pots, which you saw previously, after harvesting those pots, this is the residue she will collect. And then she pulls that, as you've just, as you've just seen here, laid out the bed and plants the next crop. Incidentally, this Bacillus vulgaris, she plant as a vegetable by grabbing any other. And then uh, this uh, residue decompose and release the nitrogen and all those nutrients to actually promote uh, better yields of the following cereal crop. And after that, after harvesting this one, now she puts in cassava, okay? Uh, this is cassava plant. And the cassava is very important for a vegetable. It's, the leaves are eaten as, um, as a vegetable, but it does contain about 52% protein and the tubers are also eating, but the tubers are very low in protein, normally about one to three percent. So she was just simply showing us that uh, for her, the most important thing is actually the leaves. It's not the young and used to go home and use that as the vegetable was finished. So this is uh, this was one of the best examples I saw in the farmer's field, where the farmer actually appreciates legume residue as a biofertilizer. Uh, this wasn't done by a seed, it was really when we just discovered it and said, wow, this is interesting that she does appreciate the value of uh, leguminous residues. Now, I just want to move on to address the fact that the legume rhizobium symbiosis can also be used to address uh, some of the physiological disorders that I showed you at the beginning, be it uh, protein, calorie malnutrition, or it is um, uh, macronutrient deficiency. And if we take that, um, looking at macronutrient deficiency is Again, one of the most, um, uh, one of the major problems that is confronting the African continent. Uh, and governments resolve this in different ways. This is the South African government approach. And this one is to overcome macronutrient deficiency, they prefer to do what's called uh, industrial supplementation. Now you just take the macronutrient, you grind it, and you mix it with the flour, or whatever it is your food base. So this is the million meal, or maize meal, or maize flour. So the, you can see here, it says we added vitamins plus selenium to keep body cells healthy. So this standard practice, this was bought from the shop. On the other side of the same millimeter bag or maize meal bag, you have plus added vitamins. 
and it will add it back in flaps, iron, and zinc on the other side. So this is how the government tries to overcome micronutrient deficiency by industrially supplementing um, trace elements into the food base, especially where you would sell food in the form of flour. And so we thought that, well, there are other ways that this one can overcome micronutrient deficiency. Uh, you can use the fertilization approach where you can apply trace element fertilizers to your crop and hopefully improve the macronutrient concentrations in the food component of that crop. Or you can also breed. You can, whether it's traditional breeding or molecular breeding, you can breed and select materials that are high in accumulating trace elements. But you can also use what I just showed you, this symbiosis induced accumulation of mineral in, um, in, in, in the plant. You've seen this slide, but it's just to recapture and say that because of this phenomenon, that through the symbiosis, the plant can accumulate a lot of mineral nutrients. It means one can actually select uh, leguminous uh, varieties. Especially in this year, we're talking about cowpea. You can select cowpea varieties that will be very high in symbiosis and plant growth, and in so doing, you are directly selecting for uh, high accumulation of micronutrients, which then, when consumed by uh, resource poor people, will overcome the, uh, the nutritional deficiency, otherwise referred to as uh, trace element deficiency. This slide just shows you uh, two things. I think I didn't mention that the cow pea leaves are here, <coughs> and the grain are also here. So here we're making the comparison of trace element concept. Concentration in leaves, edible leaves, and edible grain. Now you can see the leaves are by far a better source of the trace element than actually the grain. And in Africa, most of the food preparation from cowpea actually involve using cowpea flour. Some most often mixed with uh, vegetables such as uh, cowpea leaves. So if you take that and you mix, take the leaves and mix with the grain, then you can imagine you almost get me the composite of the data you have on this slide. And indeed, when you go to rural areas where children are growing up in communities where they have this sort of living, those children don't suffer from trace element deficiency because of the kind of nutrition that they are getting from, uh, from their diet. And so this, uh, then the next slide actually try to compare, this is spinach, which is commercially sold in, uh, in all the shops in South Africa. And we just compare the value, the dietary value of spinach and cowpea in terms of trace elements. And you can see iron and manganese in particular are strikingly higher in uh, your cowpea uh, leaves compared to the commercial spinach which they sell in the food shops. And so, again, uh, we think it, it would be a great idea somebody to actually get into business and sell, your, sell cowpea spinach. And sort of call them, just, just say it's cowpea spinach. And you, you be increasing your uh, iron content and manganese content, at least um, uh, when it comes to those two in particular. And the other thing is that because, as I've said, all these legumes are natrium fixed, and in the case of cowpea, it's a natrium fixer. We saw the level that some of them can fix. It therefore means that the leaf protein levels tend to be very high. And this one slide shows you that uh, top one, Soronko, that variety there has about 40% leaf protein. So once more, if you feed on that kind of cowpea uh, leaf, uh, the potential, of course, I'm not talking about bioavailability, we know that's a whole new topic. Whether these uh, trace elements or the protein becomes available, uh, it's another story also. You need to do clinical studies, but at least they have the potential to increase consumption and hopefully uh, absorption of these um, of the trace elements and in this case of, of uh, increasing the protein meeting the protein requirements of the body and so they do have different levels of leaf protein depending on the efficiency of the natural infection symbiosis uh, this was uh, where that was done at a while we we'll just look at another one at the time this was why in Ghana this is Chawin in South Africa and you can see a different genotype bent at the top also the leaf uh, contain about 40% protein, just again indicating the potential for using, uh, you know, cowpea leaves as a source of uh, uh, nutrition for meeting the protein requirements of uh, rural communities. 
Now, I, I showed you the slides about the symbiosis induced mineral accumulation. Now, what I, I, what I haven't explained to you is the basis for it. I just said, okay, you fix a lot of nitrogen and you can see a lot of minerals. So, because these were field grown plants. The next thing we then did was to try and understand uh, what is the basis for that. And the only way you can do it is to now take strains, rhizobium bacteria strains, and grow plants, the microbiologically controlled conditions in the glass house where you inoculate you know, your legume with a specific strain and then monitor the nitrogen fixing efficiency against mineral accumulation in order to understand what actually uh, is responsible for that. And this is just a setup of, this is what I call the conventional Leonard jars, uh, where you, you sterilize all these units, sterilize, simply sterilize your grain, then you can sow, you cover it when it germinates, put cotton wool around, and make sure that you exclude any other bacterium growing other than the one that you've used to inoculate your, your seedlings. So these cowpea seedlings grow in Leonard jars. And uh, when we harvested them, at some stage, we included uh, 0.5 millimolar nitrate as control, uh, when we harvested them, these are seven strains that we tested. You can see there are differences in plant growth. And because these plants are 100% dependent on nitrogen fixation for their nitrogen nutrition, uh, in the olden days, microbiologists actually just used the biomass, either the shoot biomass or the whole plant biomass as a measure of nitrogen fixation, because they're not getting nitrogen from any source other than from the agronutrients. But at least you can see that those two strains at the top are the highest in uh, promoting plant growth, um, much higher than even when you uh, introduce a mineral nitrogen at a level of 0.5 millimolar. These other ones, the third one downwards, are fairly low in nitrogen fixation, um, uh, well, in promoting plant growth. Let me not say nitrogen fixation as yet. And then if we uh, take this slide, I think I'll, yeah, I can explain that to, there's another slide I showed up that I'm back. But in doing this work, all I wanted to show is that the better growth or the superior growth we saw in plant that we inoculated with those uh, two strains, which are based in the data now, is due to essentially to photosynthesis production. So we did vast exchange studies and we measured photosynthesis, and you can see that uh, uh, the amount of photosynthesis produced by these two strains is much higher than that one, and uh, also compared to your uh, two millimolar nitrate. Confirming the fact that plant growth uh, in, uh, by those two strains was actually due to higher carbon accumulation. And of course, for you to accumulate more carbon or large amount of carbon, you need to have a considerable amount of nitrogen, which comes from uh, value to nitrogen fixation. I'm going to skip that. It's the same thing put in a different way. So when we then harvested those plants and we measured the amount of nitrogen fed by those bacteria strains, on the same host plant, this is a, uh, a cultivar, GBU11424. Now you can see those two strains that promote give the highest plant growth also fix the most nitrogen. And this is the difference between total plant nitrogen minus seed nitrogen, because they are getting nothing from nowhere else other than from the energy. And we then analyze the minerals against the background of uh, plant growth promotion as well as nitrogen. And you can see the two that fix the most nitrogen generally are also accumulated the most mineral nutrients, especially the major nutrients. Um, nitrate treatment, uh, in some instances, uh, was close to those two, but never equal. And you don't have those other strains intermediate, which are low fixes relative to uh, the first two at the top. Clearly showing that nitrogen fixing efficacy or the nitrogen fixing uh, ability when or the level of nitrogen fix is what is uh, drives the amount of mineral uh, minerals that are accumulated. And if we look at the um, uh, the trace elements again, same amount of N fix. Now you can see those two strains once more tend to have accumulated uh, by far a lot more macronutrients compared to the other strains which are much lower in nitrogen fixation, and also compared uh, to your 0.5 millimolar nitrogen. So the take home then here is that essentially is this efficacy of the symbiosis between the bacterium and the legume that actually drives how much uh, minerals are accumulated within the plant. 
And if I may add, um, those into genomics who study uh, the early establishment of nitrogen fixation, they will tell you that once the nodulation genes, as I showed you before, are expressed um, in the host plant, the legume, and in the bacterial cell, other, uh, some of the genes that get expressed are related to mineral nutrition. Uh, phosphatases, uh, which are responsible for phosphorus nutrition, uh, they get expressed. Uh, and a whole host of them. So, which clearly shows that uh, their expression is directly linked to the symbiotic process. And hence why it's not surprising that you will get this kind of symbiosis induced accumulation of minerals uh, directly linked to the efficacy of the bacteria strain. So, one can conclude by saying that biological um, uh, nitrogen fixation is in the African situation where there is resource poor uh, farmers, that BNF is actually the future if there's to be any green revolution in Africa, because if farmers cannot afford any fertilizer. Nitrogen fixation legumes has the capacity to address food insecurity, soil infertility, and human nutrition and health, and nitrogen fixing healthy genotypes are a high source of dietary protein and uh, nutrient element, uh, a nutrient element for human nutrition and health. I also showed you some, yeah, and uh, symbiotic therapy also shows greater nutrient density in leaves than grain. I showed you some farmers here, this slide, there's some data that was cut off, but essentially all what it, it was meant to summarize is that the proportion of grain derived from fixation by legumes is generally quite substantial in farmer fields and market. It ranges from 14 to 95%. You can really see the other slide that I excluded has portion, that's what you see there. But the actual amount of N contributed to crop system is very small due to the uh, very low legume density that farmers normally have in their fields. And uh, nitrogen fixation correlated positively with the mineral nutrients. You can, whether you look at mineral N content or you look at the percentage nitrogen derived from fixation or the amount of N fixed measured in milligrams or kilograms, you can see they all correlate very nicely with uh, the different nutrients. And I, with that, I'd just like to thank the people that uh, helped me with funds for research, the, you know, all those listed there, and I think the most important people are this group of youngsters. Uh, they are the students. Uh, these two are not, uh, this actually they are from the Gay Foundation, and they have given me some grant for capacity building in Africa, and uh, it was one moment when they came and we took this uh, uh, group photograph. So a lot of our representatives down back, some of them, some have graduated and gone, others are still in the lab. But yeah, they do all the hard work. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Very good on you. So I'm sure Felix would be happy to answer some questions or enter a discussion if anybody's interested. Tony. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I, I understand, I, I mean, I don't understand uh, much about agriculture, but, uh, but I, I think I understood your point about the idea of, uh, I mean, I, I take it that the, your recommendation would be to increase the amount of legumes uh, being farmed, what, every, pretty much everywhere in the African continent, or, or is it more in some places than others that that would be um, beneficial? No, no, actually across the whole continent. Yeah. I mean, Africa is big, but it's virtually the same when it comes to the problems. Uh, I think outside South Africa, which has um, a fairly uh, advanced uh, agriculture, the rest are more traditional systems. And so if you're going <coughs> to promote uh, crop yields, uh, you don't have money, then your best bet is to go with the legumes. So yes, we are promoting the legumes at all, uh, I mean, across the board. Even the sophisticated uh, commercial farmers, they will tell you nitrogen fertilizer is bloody expensive. Mm -hmm. And they can get anything from legumes, they would rather go for that. And uh, so even they are coming on board and they want to apply inoculants where it's necessary and forget about nitrogen fertilizer so they can spend their money on phosphorus, potassium, and all the other uh, fertilizers. So yes, 
is across the board within the African continent. That, that gets at, at sort of the second part I, I wanted to ask you about is the, uh, the economics of doing that. Mm. And, and what you just alluded to is, is right on what I was wondering. I guess from a subsistence point of view, I can, I can see you know, that this is very clearly, and you've got all the data showing that why <coughs> that's good from a food production point of view from subsistence. And, you, and now you're saying that on the commercial side, it's, it's also beneficial. Yep. Is, is that just based on the economics of legume production versus uh, fertilizer costs? Is, is that the aspect? We have two of them. Uh, it's, in fact, you could say more than two. One, if you're, if you're a commercial uh, farm, you save money by using enough lands wherever possible. You don't have to always use enough lands. If your legume not lays freely with the indigenous soil, you don't even bother. But at least what you learn is that don't apply nitrogen to your legumes. So that's a major saving. And the nitrogen fertilizers are more expensive. Secondly, uh, they realize that when they use the legumes, they actually get much higher sustained yields because of the organic carbon that's in the soil. The ones, many of them, are even those who are into big uh, soybean production, they'll put soybean through one year, and the following year, they're going to move somewhere else and put it to wheat, or they put it to maize. And uh, they know they don't have to apply nitrogen fertilizer, but they are aware that your soils are you know, much more retensive of soil moisture. They know that the yields, <coughs> excuse me, come out much better than um, uh, when you use mineral fertilizers. So at the end of the day, it's, it's conservation of, uh, what you may call conservation agriculture. It's not intended that way, but they know the spin-offs of using legumes. And they have done the economics. They've done the economics of it, and they know that it's a major saving uh, in terms of cost of fertilizer, there's also increase in yields in the longer term. If you do it for a period of three to four years, uh, you see that your soils are much better, uh, they are much uh, higher in fertility, but as I keep saying, soil organic matter. If you have more soil organic matter, then you tend to improve the soil moisture conditions, and in Africa, drought is very intermittent. So you're more likely then to have crop that can somehow, uh, you know, withstand intermittent drought than when you just apply direct mineral fertilizers. That some of the experienced farmers will tell you, and they document a lot of things. So I know that you've used different genotypes of the cow peas, and you've used different genotypes of rhizobia. Yep. Yes, yeah. Sorry, uh, the way I presented the data, I excluded the interaction. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. Definitely. Some Razobia perform better with some genotypes than the others. But here, the, the purpose was different. But I didn't get to tell you another reason why I put up that slide. And it was just essentially to talk on, I mentioned the fact that the photosynthetic production was higher in the genotypes that have the high fixing strains on them. But I also wanted to mention a bit about the mechanism, how this all of this could be happening, and that relates more to stomata function. That uh, if you were to look back at those slides, you see that the high fixing strains, or she has a high fixing combination of cowpea and bacteria, essentially also always had very high stomatal conductance. And the stomatal con functioning is related to uh, some of the metabolites that bacteria release. And typically, one of them is lumicro, uh, uh, riboflavin, and then, of course, uh, ABA and cytokines. They all are important. And we've done earlier work where we could show that when you apply lumicro, you apply uh, ABA, abscisic acid, and you apply 10 mils of living bacteria cells you know, plasma control. At the end of the day, those three look, they're not specifically uh, different, but they're always very high up compared to your control where you don't apply any of those. Which simply means that whatever we get in terms of nutrients going up, uh, it's not magical. I think it's just a bacteria molecule that stimulates uh, 
stomatal functioning, leading to a stronger xylem pool with more nutrients going up in the water to the leaves, and in the process, that plant accumulates more. That, that was the aim. But yes, there are there were interactions. Sorry, the stomata yeah. are wider open, right? Yeah. The ones that are photosynthesizing more. So is there a drought risk if you have such a high level of photosynthetic capacity, or is it not even close to that threshold? Is there a, a drought risk, so water use capacity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. That's a very interesting question. When you do those sort of studies, it's amazing. You see one bacteria strain does, it, it opens stomata, uh, and stimulate photosynthetic production in one genotype. The same bacterial strain with another genotype does the opposite. Actually, you get shocking of the stomata, so you get very reduced um, stomatal conductance, which leads to reduced photosynthetic production. As I said, I, it's just that I didn't go into that part of the talk. So you do it, it's a balancing act. And depending of, on what happens in the field, if a particular variety is nodulated by a particular strain, or in fact, it doesn't have to be nodulation, it's just a matter of having the macrosymbion in the rhizosphere, all right, producing those metabolites. Then they become environmental cues that tell the plants that, hey, the drought is coming, it's getting very dry, you need to now start shutting your, your stomata, and they do that. Or if it's that, uh, it's just normal, Field capacity, you know, the sun is shining, the temperatures are good, and everything works well, and you get a reverse where a particular genotype now just accumulates more minerals uh, in order. So, yeah, there, there is a threshold on the one hand uh, for some genotypes, depending on which way you are looking at whether it's the opening or it is the closing. But the, and the effect is incidentally not typical of only legumes. We did that work but also non with uh, monocots. We did it with uh, sorghum, we did it with maize, and they have, they show it, similar uh, responses with the treatment that we gave. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, I want to pick up, up on the, the drought issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming with climate change there will be extreme weather, so whether drought or flooding. What type of um, adaptation mechanism you see not just within the, the biological aspect, but in terms of practice for climate. Uh, what kind of? How will climate adapt to climate change? So that one extreme, yeah. Based on the research you did. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Farmers are much more clever than we think, and uh, they taught me to not worry about all these fanciful technologies we use, but to walk through the field and just look at genotypes and see how they are responding to the same environmental condition. And it's true. Um, if you walk through a field with, hypothetically speaking, let's just say 25 genotypes of granite, which happens to be one of those that I observed, you're gonna see by eight o'clock in the morning, they all look a normal crop. When you look at the, the foliage, the, the canopy, they look a normal crop. By 10 o'clock, in African and African condition, when the sun is beginning to heat up, you see immediately the ones that are uh, less drought tolerant, tolerant. You see that the leaves are beginning to look slightly wilted. By 12 noon to 2 o'clock, those ones have changed completely. They are totally down. They are wilted. Now you're going to see some other genotypes that just stick out their neck. From morning, was it 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, they look the same. Now, if you do a, a rating score, if you score them, and uh, we did it before, if you score them on the basis of what I've just explained, when you do your nitrogen fixation uh, studies, there's, there's another bit that comes with uh, your question. You always get delta C tating, which is an integrated measure of water use efficiency. You always get that as a bonus from mass spectrometry. And so when we did those uh, studies, uh, the mass spec analysis, you know, it was interesting to see that the genotypes that wilted between eight o'clock and two o'clock, they've gone down, of course, gradually.
versus the one that stood up strong all the way to this day. Distinct, sharp differences, statistically huge differences between the Delta CT given values. Normally, the higher the Delta CT given value, the more drought tolerance. So the guys that stuck up their leaves and were looking good, they had very high Delta CT given values, which is high water use efficiency. The other ones that are least water use efficient and flopped over with higher temperature due to uh, that of what results in, in drought, because the higher the temperature, the more moisture you're going to lose from the leaves and also from the soil with the stomach and the shutdown. You see, those ones tend to have extremely low delta C keeping value. So yes, the farmers are aware, and that's actually how they, that's what they use to select um, their material for next year's farming. Whether it is granite, whether it's cow feed, whether it's maize, they have those standard measures which, which uh, they apply in the field and they'll tell them that that one is more drought tolerant. That other field on this side of the village, that place is generally drier compared to this other side. Next year, I think I'll be cropping this one over. So they, they do know that. Incidentally, they teach X, we don't teach X. So Farmer <coughs> Education Day means they're educating you, not the other way around. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Yes, Aldona. Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm coming at this from a trace gases perspective. From? Uh, trace gases. A uh, trace gases? Uh, yeah, climate related trace gases. Okay. So, of course, I appreciate that not buying and tracking nitrogen fertilizers is, is a good thing for uh, carbon dioxide related to the atmosphere for transportation. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you're also looking at um, whether some of these combinations are better or worse uh, for eventual nitrous oxide production. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, it's a very good question also, um, like all the others. Basically, I think the debate historically was, is nitrogen fixation less harmful to agriculture in terms of, uh, you know, uh, nitrogen, uh, emission of nitrogen gas? Uh, and of course, those who are into nitrogen fixation tend to be defensive. You know, you like to say your system is holier than that, it's angelic, it doesn't pollute. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that nitrogen fixing nodules do produce nitrogen oxide. I think the fundamental difference, though, is that you need to have an ample lot of nodules, you know, massive nodulation everywhere in order for that to compete with, for example, if you put in um, Farmyard manure, uh, as a case study, or if you put in uh, nitrogen fertilizers, where you run into conditions of uh, water logging, if it rains, or the sudden it is flooded, and you know denitrification takes place rather than nitrification, uh, or if there's organic matter, and again you get some, the whole week is been raining, and all your soils are flooded. Organic matter cannot mineralize. You know, if, if there's anything at all, it's going the other way of the nitrification. So it's still safe to say that the legumes are relatively less uh, nitric oxide emission from nodulated uh, legumes. It's still much less from the field studies that are there compared to where people either apply uh, farmyard manure, like cow dung, or you, you, you fertilize with uh, directly with human fertilizer. But yeah, I haven't measured that. Uh, it's something, but I'm, we are all conscious of it. We are aware of it, and and it's good to just say that look, they also pollute. Right? The, why we don't get much more from it is just because you need a massive nodulation all the way around in this room for you to get uh, a significant contribution. Mm -hmm. But if you take it on a global scale, yeah, you you're going to end up with a figure. There will be a figure for nodulation. Yeah, they are also conscious. Feel like it's a lower level compared to the other uh, uh, methods of fertilizing crop. Yeah, oh, and of course you have to consider the farming system as a whole as well. Yeah. Um, for emissions across the board, not just from one particular aspect. Yep. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to take the privilege of asking the last question, okay. which is. You could snap your fingers mm -hmm. and address what you think is the most limiting factor mm 
to the expansion of biological nitrogen fixation through legumes in Africa. What would that be? And maybe Africa is too big. Let's talk about your oh, part yeah. of South Africa. Yeah. What What is the like you referred to? Density, low density, yeah. which I don't understand why it's so low. But what what is the limiting factor to expansion of BNF in South Africa? Okay, uh, let me just take the minor point here. To once you say you don't know why the density is so low, it's just because of um, uh, not wanting to put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. You know, climate change has been with us for a while. Just that it's, it wasn't seen. The situation didn't magnify itself the way we see it today. But over from the 60s, you know, up till now, there have been these, uh, I don't know how to call that, uh, cyclic events, if one can call it so. They look cyclic. I'm not entirely sure they are cyclic, but I haven't done the diagram. But I just know one year you can get terrible rainfalls. You know, the whole place flooded and dams are breaking. Then another year it's all drought. You know, you don't get any very minuscule rain and there's, you know, so you go from one extreme where there's hunger to another extreme where there's hunger. <laughs> and so when the farmers go to plant, and because they generally do intercropping, what they tend to do is they say, you know, let's throw different crops into the same plot, but we have to maintain the distance because if you're going to get them too close and there's drought, you're going to have a snack. So hence why they they, they actually have very low yeah. densities, yeah. you know, they, they follow. And, and again, as I was saying, they're not stupid, they're very clever. Mm -hmm. Because when it happens, you go to your farm and see, a maize plant is literally dead before it reaches this height, dead. Because there's no water, but you can look and say, oh, the legume is looking good. And you turn, unlike it's jokapi, you see that, no, there are some pots. And if it's cowpea, you look at it, there are some pots formed. Some, obviously, are bought flowers will abort, some pots will also abort in the process depending on the stage of development when the drought you know, set in. So it's the farmer's way of making sure that at least they can harvest something okay. from the field in the event of complete uh, you know, uh, rain failure, mm -hmm. or should I say prolonged rain failure. Mm -hmm. But coming back to your actual question, um, what is stopping biological nitrogen fixation from being uh, utilized to increase crop yields. I think, at the, really, at the end of the day, um, the first one will be just by which I've indicated. If you're going to tell farmers to uh, put in a lot more legume to increase the density of legume in their cropping system, then you have to give them a bigger piece of land. In many instances, in very few places, the farmers have the luxury of uh, hundreds of acres. Somebody's farm size is a farm is the size of this this place. That lady I showed with the cassava, her patch is very small, and the patches are located. So the only way you can expand your uh, land under cultivation is to beg your neighbor whose land has been lying there not cultivated, if they will allow you to to crop it this year. Right? They allow you. Then you can do that. So I think, first and foremost, it's dictated by the size of land, in many instances. Mm -hmm. That you, if, if there is, yeah, no, let me just leave it that way. It's dictated by that. Secondly, we as the uh, plant scientists or agricultural scientists, <coughs> excuse me, have not tailor-made genotypes that can fit into the shorter rainfall uh, pattern of the environment. You know, I mean, I was surprised when I was at uh, Saskatoon for the conference from which I came here. Now I see they only have a growing season of just three months. And they're able to get a bumper harvest for that. You know, what struck me there was, why can't we have genotypes of the crop, various crops that we grow in Africa for a shorter season? So. We can't tell when, it, it's not like here. Here, okay, your system is fairly fixed. You know when it's going to be winter, you know when it's going to be summer. And you know when it's summer, you're going to get your summer rains. If you don't get it anyway, the snow has melted and the soils are still looking good. Uh, the African situation is different. When you have the rainfall can shift from, it may start in April and continue and maybe stop in June. Uh, if you put in there, you harvest. 
If you didn't put in, nothing comes from this August, you get rain again, and that stretches to mid-October and stop. So it's quite unpredictable. But having said that, the major constraint, in my view, is that we haven't, the agricultural scientists haven't come up with genotypes that are tailor-made for very short seasons. Uh, cow feed, there are 60-day maturity cow feeds. So if you go two months of reasonable soil moisture, you can get a good crop of cow feed. Okay, but not all the farmers have that. Mm -hmm. you know, some, I know that because I'm working with cow feed. The farmers have, some farmers have got some, the majority don't. If you go to ground up, it's the same thing. So actually what we need to do now, if we're gonna handle DNA, is to try and have short duration genotypes mm -hmm. of the various legumes, so that when the season is that shortened, you can still plant and harvest some yield. Mm. But we haven't done that. Mm. And, uh, and that's also because, we haven't done that because uh, shifting the blame to others. You know, African governments are not terribly serious about food security. They just have to, to get aid from here and there, and, and that is it. Mm -hmm. you know, if a government is serious about food security, it means all the structures of government that are involved in, in food production will be talking together, the so-called stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But they are not. And so everyone you know, does his own thing. And at the end, we, we, we don't get the benefit that we ought to get mm -hmm. from BNF. But I think the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have defunded an end, it's called End to Africa Project. And that's to uh, stimulate uh, legume production in Africa, or to stimulate the uh, dissemination of legume technology to small-scale farmers in Africa. Uh, it was funded at 21, excuse me, 0.9 million. It ended last year, I just had in you know, uh, Saskatoon, they've been refunded with 30 million for another five years. Mm -hmm. So hopefully what we're discussing is what they are going to do. Mm -hmm. I've seen some work that I'm, well, or should I say I'm participating in some work, which is developing legume innovations. And essentially you take uh, genotypes, for example, that are high fixin, maybe drought tolerant, and you go to a farmer's field, and you can get, I know one uh, trial in Mozambique had 250 farmers. So you go, if it's a farmer, you gotta say, look, we've got five genotypes of cow pea, you grow in one, put in yours, and plant it with our farm who will come and help you from time to time to, and uh, you know, we talk about what we are seeing together. And you do that with 250 farmers. Now, at the end of the day, the farmers discovered that their own genotype, I've seen that uh, on two trips, their own genotype is not doing well compared to the three elite genotypes that have been brought in from research stations. Uh, and that project is funded by USAID. Now that I sought to be the smartest way to actually disseminate, disseminate anything out about legumes, mm -hmm. including natural fixation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the farmer will say, no, actually I don't need my own. <laughs> Your three genotypes are good, or oh, that one mm -hmm. is the best. And then they will harvest and keep the seed. Mm -hmm. Normally they don't, you don't take the seed, they keep it to plant the following year. Mm -hmm. I think with that kind of innovation, mm -hmm. we will succeed, both in the context of exploiting BNF and indeed in promoting superior uh, legume genotypes. But this is all done outside the efforts of any African government. Mm -hmm. This USAID money. If if government could do something like that within the ministries of agriculture and extension work, I think we'll succeed. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are not interested. Mm -hmm. They believe food will come from will fall a manner from the head. <laughs> <laughs> That's our problem. <laughs> well, uh, please join me again in thanking Felix for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.